Today on the Paul Street Journal, Brian and I will be discussing inheritance, and inheritance being what possessions you leave to the next generation, your kids, your extended family. And we're going to be talking about what role inheritance plays in Catholic social teaching, why inheritance is a topic of ours, and, and how it can actually be a very useful thing to build up God's kingdom. Where is the start of inheritance in Catholic social teaching? Where do we first look? Well, it's all over Scripture, and all Catholic teaching begins with Scripture and then goes from there. In the Old Testament, we hear about inheritance really early on. We, we know about the story of Jacob and Esau and the bowl of soup and the theft mm -hmm. and the deception, right? Mm -hmm. That's an example of primogeniture, which is such a bad system that it ends up being replaced even in the law of Moses. So by the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, we see that that's replaced with the eldest child getting a double share and then the rest of the children getting a single share. Now, we remember from season one, episode five, early medieval economics, primogeniture finds its way back into Catholicism because of the barbarian influence in the collapse of the Roman Empire. But it wasn't a Jewish thing by that time. It wasn't a Christian or a Catholic thing by that time. And primogeniture causes lots of problems, and it leads to sons killing fathers and mm. brothers killing brothers. It's not a good system. Right, yeah, and primogeniture <laughs> being the eldest getting Everything. the entire inheritance. Right. Yeah. The balanced approach as given in the book of Deuteronomy is that the firstborn, the first fruits mm -hmm. of a, a man's manhood mm -hmm. gets the double share, which is a middle of the road approach. Right. Yeah. So then that's the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. What happens or what changes, if anything, in the New Testament? Big changes to inheritance in the New Testament. The whole idea of inheritance in the Old Testament was primarily land, the land, the promised land given to the Israelites by God through Joshua. Mm -hmm. Now, in the New Testament, let's go straight to St. Paul's letter to Titus. He saved us through the bath of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. All right. So... In the Old Testament, inheritance was the land, the promised land. And we see in Acts of the Apostles, the Jewish people who become Christians selling their land, mm -hmm. which is against the rules. Getting you're, rid you're, of their inheritance. Yeah. But what is the new inheritance? It's the new Jerusalem. It is heaven. Right. So in the New Testament, there seems to be a intentional de-emphasis on land and material goods, money and so forth, mm -hmm. with a new emphasis on the hereafter, that is eternal life. So how do you become an heir to the inheritance? It's through baptism. By being baptized, this is Romans 8, you become an adopted son or daughter of the Father, and you become an heir to that inheritance, which will be eternal life, as long as you stay within the household. Mm -hmm. What has been in the past 2,000 years the most effective means for proclaiming the gospel for evangelization, it's been strong families. Without putting too much emphasis on material goods and on possessions, strong families, and by strong I mean intergenerational families, one family transferring the faith, this idea of, of kenosis, of loving God and of loving each other from one generation to the next, that is true inheritance the giving on, the handing on of the faith. Mm -hmm. But material sustenance has been a part of it the whole time as well. Right. And that's where we come into the logistical side of inheritance, which we'll get into next. So if in the New Testament, the emphasis is now given to eternal life, but you say that the logistical side still has a role, mm -hmm. what are the Catholic economic principles at play to help us understand inheritance? For those, we have to go back to the Paul Street Journal Season 2, where we talk about private property. Remember Pope Leo XIII and Pope Pius XI? Locational stability, which we talked about even in season one, and then the primacy of the family, which was a major emphasis in all the encyclicals. When it comes to inheritance, every father and mother of a household needs to have an intergenerational way of thinking and living. And that creates a strong fabric for society. 
So remember, Pope Leo XIII was saying that property, private property, is the storage of the value of a family for future sustenance. Mm -hmm. That's not just for the sustenance of the father and the mother of the house, but for the children and for the children's children. Yeah, I think it's it's important to know that this idea, this Catholic idea of inheritance isn't an either or. It's not either the inheritance of eternal life and the faith mm -hmm. or of material goods and land, but it's really both. They both point us to that one that's emphasized. Mm -hmm. well and said. I, think, I think these principles help us understand that. So we've talked about before that liberalism calls for each generation to essentially start from scratch economically. But the church prefers, like you've mentioned, intergenerational solidarity, stability, and apprenticeship. How does that apply? How can we live out what the church prefers versus what liberalism has to offer? The first thing I would recommend is for every father and mother of a household to have a multi-generational vision. So most people have good intentions, but no plan. They might have a giant bank account to, to live off of, an annuity or a retirement plan. And basically they plan on living off of that. And if there's any left over when they die, the children just get the rest, right? right? And that's not a plan. Yeah. So I recommend that you come up with a concrete plan. This includes properties, businesses, assets, stocks, and so forth. Your plan should be influenced by the gospel and by spirituality. So you start by thinking about your family, and then you think about the church. That's the worship of the church, buildings, the ministers, the works of charity, and so forth. Your inheritance plan should be clearly articulated. And if you have anything of substance to leave behind, that probably means having a trust and an executor who can make sure that what you want to happen actually happens. The trust is a legal vehicle to protect it and to make sure that it's handled the way you want it to. In regards to percentages, while equality amongst all your children is ideal, it's oftentimes not practical. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a house to give away, one house, and you have four children. To give all four children that one house is not helpful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're gonna have to liquefy it to split it, yeah. and or, or does only one family get that house, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's a little messy. So ideally, if you have a plan, it involves many different types of assets and you're thinking about your own children. Okay, this kid can't be trusted with cash. <laughs> He'll just blow it, <laughs> right? This, this kid would be very good with a business. This kid would be really good with property, mm -hmm. right? So have a plan that suits each kid if you can. And you do not need to divide everything equally. Sometimes it's okay to think with a little bit of an Old Testament background in your mind. And, and sometimes it's acceptable to give a little bit more to the first fruits of the family, the, the oldest child, man mm -hmm. or woman. Mm -hmm. It's okay to disinherit your children if they are poorly behaved. That's Deuteronomy 21. Mm -hmm. And don't forget about the story of the prodigal son. If you have a child that's off track but comes back, it's okay to re-inherit them. Mm -hmm. So there's no obligation to give money to bad children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think having a multi-generational vision makes all of this make more sense. You know, mm -hmm. you have to start thinking about not only the sustenance of your family and kids in this moment, but realize that there's something coming later. You're going to pass away one day. Mm -hmm. And all the things that you've worked for, that you've tried to provide for your family with a concrete plan mm -hmm. can continue to sustain them and help them do the same for the next generation, right? This is not just one generation, but multiple generations. Mm -hmm. And you should, you should be thinking about Catholic social teaching and the ideals at stake. The church has always thought lesser of the proletarian economic model. The church has always desired people to own their land, their house, and the capital that they use to make a living. Mm -hmm. So if you, as a benefactor, could provide one of those things or all of those things for the next generation, that's a very good thing. You should not as a benefactor th just assume that they're gonna start from scratch, that they're gonna acquire their own land, their own house, their own means of production, right? Try to provide that for them and that's helping that intergenerational solidarity. So Brian, I think this is great advice, but what if you don't have any kids, you don't have a direct next generation 
in your family. It happens often, and it's okay. So think about your extended family. Remember in the Paul Street Journal and in Catholic culture, we're not thinking just about our nuclear family, but about our extended family, our household, our tribe, if you will. And also think about the poor. Think about the church. What can be done in that regard? In regards to practical application, you could have a charitable remainder trust, which is something that maximizes your income as you live. And then when you die, the rest of the money in there goes to a charity and it's all tax free, which is a huge benefit. Very awesome. So besides the charitable remainder trust, which you mentioned is tax free, are there any other assets that you can transfer to the next generation also tax free, which is probably something people would find very beneficial? Sure. Yeah. Uh, depending on the size of your estate, there will be state and federal estate taxes. These are components of the liberal movement to ensure that every generation starts from scratch, which is not a Catholic idea. Of course, we don't want Catholics hoarding wealth at the expense of others, but in a fiat currency environment, wealth could be created out of nowhere, and there's no limit to the amount of money in the economy. So with that being said, we want to encourage strong families to continue to be strong, and we want financial stability and even locational stability for these families. So in a taxed environment for estates, there's a few shelters. One of them is life insurance, where you purchase a policy and whatever that policy is worth at the death of the benefactor goes to the beneficiaries tax-free. Individual stocks as well. If you own an individual stock and you pass away, that stock goes to your heir tax-free. So I think we gave a lot of practical advice, primarily to have a multi-generational vision and to have a concrete plan so that your inheritance is well-planned, well-dispersed, and your next generation benefits from that. And don't forget that the ultimate inheritance is the new Jerusalem, eternal life, the Amen. promised land. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and I think that that's at the forefront of the vision. Mm -hmm. So I think that that should inform the decisions you make uh, in regards to inheritance. And that does it for this episode of the Paul Street Journal. Thanks for watching.